What is going on, everyone? It's Justin and Brandon here back with the Feature Podcast. And in this episode, we have a very special guest in an industry that we're both very interested in, which is sneakers, but with a very unique perspective. Mm-hmm. It's Seth Fowler, and he is a YouTuber who creates videos on sneakers, as well as his industrial design experience in making custom shoes. And he also has one that is currently available for purchase. So we're going to talk to him about that as well. He has over 600,000 subscribers on YouTube and all of his stuff is going to be linked down below. But without further ado, this is a great interview. So I hope you guys enjoy it. But yeah, today we have Seth Fowler. Thank you so much for joining us. I've been subscribed to your channel for a couple of years now, and uh, you have a lot of great stories to tell. And I think you have one thing that is very unique about your channel, and that is your perspective from the side of an industrial designer. Um, and that is um, that is an area that I am very fascinated by. I actually sort of thought about going to... Um, to apply for Savannah College uh, for industrial design. Oh, that's awesome. We like, I like went on the website and stuff, didn't really read too much into it, uh, but I used to be really big into drawing when I was a kid, but ended up going the business direction and dropped out of that into new YouTube. But um, yeah, I think that's a really cool perspective that you have. Um, so yeah, we're gonna talk about like, I guess some of the shoe side, uh, compare like the industries of tech because you're in that space as well. And also talk about the sneaker game and designs and collaborations and all that fun stuff. Um, but yeah, the first question I think I have is, how did you get into sneakers and have you always been interested in sneakers? Uh, yeah, I've always been into sneakers. I think it was a slow burn. Um, starting off younger, I always played basketball, so I always had an understanding of, of sneakers, but I was never really like, when I, when I was growing up, I was never really, I, I didn't know all the names of the different ones. I just knew Jordans were Jordans and, you know, Adidas were Adidas and things like that. But as I got older, I started, um, really developing a passion for design. And then I started to notice not only sneakers, but fashion and, and also just the products that we use every day. Um, and then when I was around 16, I got a job at Vans. Um, which was right next to uh, the sneaker store in in the Columbia or in Maryland uh, called DTLR, and so every day at lunch I'd go over into DTLR and see like the new foams or whatever it was it released, um, and uh, it, it just sort of grew from there. And then um, through college I started customizing sneakers because I, I was trying to find a, I had a couple jobs uh, on the side and I wanted to earn a little bit more income, so I decided to start customizing, um, and that really got me connected with some of the people in Philly. Um, And then that sort of blossomed into, uh, I started buying a lot of sneakers and it got to a point where I was just like, you know what? I have so many sneakers. I need to do something with them other than just keep them in the closet. So I decided to start, uh, doing YouTube videos on them, which is interesting because I'd always been into YouTube and I'd always made YouTube videos, but it had never been about sneakers. And then, uh, I was just like, this is, maybe this is the direction. And it just happened, (laughs) it just happened to work out. (laughs) How did you, uh, promote your sneaker designs at the beginning there when you were just doing it locally and pushing it that way? It was a lot of um, Facebook groups. There was this one yeah, Facebook group in OG Philly ways. called um, "That's the Way." Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's this one Facebook group in Philly called "Buy Sell Fresh Kicks Philly," and it's where everyone would uh, like um, buy, buy and sell fresh kicks in Philly. And so I would, uh, <laughs> I, I bought a couple. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I bought a couple pairs of Vans and I customized them, and then um, just posted pictures of those shoes up on up on that Facebook group. And then I, I got one person's custom, um, and I just. Every time I do a custom, I post it on the group, and then I'd start posting it on Instagram. And as I started building up a, a small following, um, I just started connecting with other customizers and started taking um, like uh, orders from people all over the country. And it, it slowly grew into um, into a small but busy business. <laughs> yeah, we also have a sneaker group. Uh, it's called Streetwear Vancouver. There's quite yeah, a few Vancouver oh, awesome. sne- yeah. sh- sneaker. Uh, VSG, I think it is. My yeah. favorite sneakerheads group. We used yeah. to be uh, awesome. very active in that. Uh, I would say yeah. 2015, 16 is when I spent too much money on shoes. <laughs> but nowadays, those pages are just like a bunch of kids like fighting with each other about who scammed who, who lied about the totally condition. Right. And, and it's just like yep. sort of funny to read, but it does get a bit, a bit tiring. Um, my, my entry into sneakers was kind of the, the whole 2015 Adidas wave with, mm-hmm. with the Yeezys and everything uh, and ended up collecting those for a bit. And then... Up until then, I I think it must have been 20 pairs of shoes. There wasn't a single one that was a Nike. It was all Adidas. But then somehow, um, it was just like the way, the the time that I entered was when Adidas was making like the NMDs, the Yeezys and everything, the Ultra Boost and all the collaborations like one after another. And so I eventually got rid of all the the Adidas and ended up with the 
the Jordan collection, um, the the off white line, and just kept those as grills, and just went back to wearing like common projects and the simple outfits. But yeah, we did make a couple videos on like shoes and stuff. And I found that like the millennial audience that was into technology was also interested in sneakers uh, and it, tech being a very saturated space. A lot of the times, a lot of the sneaker videos ended up doing better than the than the tech <laughs> ones. Uh, so it's funny that you mentioned that you uh, you had all the sneakers and you had a love for them. And mm -hmm. by making a YouTube channel, it, it naturally was clear that people enjoyed watching the content and could tell that you that you knew what you're talking about uh, and a lot of times like yeah a lot of pe people have like great collections but yeah like how did you capitalize when when because you were doing youtube videos before this whole adidas wave right you're og mm -hmm. man you're in the facebook groups before grailed before any of these ways to buy sneakers online when adidas hit and when everyone really became a sneakerhead, how did you really capitalize on momentum well i think i started my channel at the right time um i started it in two, the early 2016 and that's when like sneaker YouTube was really, I think, at its peak, um, yeah. and everyone was like really into it. And that's when that's when Yeezy was with um, was with Adidas. Like that's when all yeah. the 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 Yeezys were first coming out, like the 750s, 350s. Um, and so I just buy every sneaker that I could. At that point, I was working in New York in Soho, which is where all like the sneaker store flagships are. Um, so every day at lunch, I'd like walk out and grab whatever shoes I could from those flagships, review them, and then either return them or sell them. Yeah. So I, it was just a lot of just like pumping out reviews like every single day. So I'd go to work. I'd, uh, I'd work from however long it was, and then I would come back um, with just like three or four boxes of sneakers, knock out as many reviews as I could, <laughs> and then just post them up as quickly as possible. And yeah. it, just, it, was, it was a grind, man. It was tough. It was a grind. <laughs> but it worked out. I, yeah, for sure. It, it's, it's totally worth Like, it's similar to what I did, actually, which is borrow uh, a lot of tech products. I think I reviewed mm -hmm. HDMI cables at some point as well, uh, and printers, <laughs> and unboxed anything that was possible. And it was just like the love of it. Whatever you'd had access to at the time, um, Tech was has always been expensive, especially unlocked phones yeah. when I wanted to review them. <laughs> but yeah, it was just uh, after school, you you buy the products, you review them, and um, eventually it, it all works out. And and it looks like you've done a great job of that. But also integrating Thanks, the industrial design side, I think is is something that I'm always fascinated about. Like the videos of of redesigning a a product. Uh, like in the shoe side, there's always a shoe where you look at it and people are like, well, I wish they just did one thing or how did they not change that? Uh, and, and even in tech, a phone comes out and people are like, how could they have made it that ugly? Uh, and general consensus, consensus is that it's ugly, but somehow the large <laughs> yeah. design team and the layers that the designs have to go through didn't pick up on what consumers are seeing. Um, mm -hmm. So I think like we, we sort of already talked about the this question, but what are the tips of starting a sneaker channel in a very saturated field? Hmm. I would say uh, being different, being yeah. unique. I feel like that's a big part of it. Um, and consistency, which is true for, I think, every yeah, every yeah. YouTuber, I feel like being consistent. Because people come to your channel because they, they sort of have an idea of, of what you're giving them. And they subscribe because they like it. So they want to keep being able to come back and getting as, as consistent content as possible, both um, in quality and also quantity. Um, so I feel like that's very important. But now, because there are so many sneaker channels, I feel like it really is about being unique. And it doesn't mean that you can't, like, review sneakers or you can't, you know, um, do what other people are doing. But just having your own personal spin and whether that's just your personality or whether it's like you're trying something different. Like, um, I'm trying to think of someone who, um, well, for example, uh, in the interview space, um, Hot Ones. Uh, complex is hot ones was such like a, a different way of approaching interviews of, of celebrities and it started the, from the ground up like the, they, these guys were just um they were just regular complex correspondents and then they'd happen to find like you know there was one celebrity in their building during that day and they were like hey do you want to come to an interview with us and then rather than just talking about whatever it was that they had coming out they would they would feed them really hot wings and that would sort of break down their barriers <laughs> and get some more information or more interesting content from them so I feel like just even if, if you want to approach the um, even if you want to do something that already seems really saturated if you really think about it and you create your own lane you shouldn't have a problem. And like another thing in um, in sneakers, that I think a lot of people have to know when they're starting out is that you don't need to have a lot of money to start out. Like with sneakers, mm -hmm. the whole hype world, a lot of times the the big titles and and the way that people think to grow is you have to have the hottest, newest, most expensive, rarest shoe and and make a video about that. And with tech, a lot of people are also like, well, I don't have access to any technology right now. How am I supposed to make any videos? Well, I think like starting out with with stuff that you have access to, if you're able to tell a story of that and do it effectively then it actually sets you up much better than having access yeah. to all the hottest things right away. Definitely. Definitely. You learn how to work with less, which is important. Yeah. 
I mean, eventually it does kind of snowball like into like new equipment and all that. But yeah, like back in the day, it was like filming on the iPod Touch, filming with borrowing stuff and just being resourceful. And that also teaches a lot of like the business side and and totally. um, using where the resources are to to get access. And um, and obviously the brand deal side of things as well uh, in, in both the tech and the sneaker industry, which I find is has a lot of crossovers in the way the business structure works out uh, in the male space, at least. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what is like the, the gender split in, in the sneaker space? Cause in tech it's like <laughs> maybe 90, 10 and on like a setup makeover video, I'm seeing like 98.5% male. <laughs> <laughs> it's very similar. It's, it's for me, it's, I just checked, I was doing like one of those, uh, those, uh, what is it called? A, uh, a press kit or Media something kit, like yeah. that last week. Yeah. And so I, I just, I just looked at it and it was saying something like, 96 four or really? something like that something insane yeah it's nuts and it's crazy too because there are a lot of women who are into sneakers yeah um but they just i, I guess it's just a very male dominated youtube space um and there are there are female channels that are starting that are really great and i think that they will blow up quickly yeah. um but I, I think until that happens it's just gonna be a lot of dudes because it, it, i just feel like it's um i don't know i i honestly i don't know i i it should it should be it should be more split, especially because it's fashion. I feel like that's such a open environment that allows pretty much anyone to come in and experience it. So I, I don't For know. For sure, yeah, yeah. Like, that that is interesting. I didn't expect that because I know like when we see tech, it's like wow, like ninety six or ni ninety ten is already a pretty high number. And I know a lot of agents in the lifestyle field outside of like the tech brand deals are, are looking for like a seventy thirty split. Um, right. But yeah, we were, we were surprised by like setup makeover because usually interior design and home design is a is a female dominated industry. I, when I used to do like right. condo videos, you would go and look at the search and there would be five pages and it would just be like the bright white LA apartment. Mm -hmm. And then you would right. see mine and it's like a black and white, like <laughs> single guy designed. Uh, even when the, totally the interior minimal. photographers came, they were like, they're like, yeah, you can tell it's like a, a single dude in his twenties <laughs> who designed this entire place. <laughs> <laughs> you got like the off-white Murakami print, the YSL board. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, but it, it's it's always interesting to look at data like that, and um, like I, I'm wondering what sneaker shops are seeing for percentages too, because uh, yeah, when the Adidas phase and um, and Yeezys were very popular, I felt like a lot of girls were also purchasing yeah, yeah. Um, those, and even Supreme and those accessories have become very popular over the years. Well, I'm kind of curious, Seth, uh, being in the sneaker space and being in design space, how is design in your house uh transcended from sneakers like justin he was just saying you know sing looks like a single 20 year old guy black and white what about you man it's really colorful in the sneaker space dude my house is is not pretty right now <laughs> <laughs> um we're, we're i like to say we're in a transitional phase right now me yeah, and my fiance you. are uh renting right now and then we're looking to buy a house so hopefully once we buy the house we can really design it the way that we want right now we're just kind of storing sure. things uh, is, is what I like to say or what we like to say. So yeah. it's not really designed at all. I think the most work I've put into any sort of design in this entire house is like sticking those panels behind me on the wall, but that's about it. I used to have those. Um, they, they were hard to mount, uh, but they do look they do look really they good. Are. Add a bit of dimension aside from like mm -hmm. the white walls that, uh, that a, kidding, lot of, eh? a lot of us have. Yep. Um, but yeah, I remember uh, when I went to Atlanta to visit Harrison, um, he, he has like a separate suite rented in the same building at the time uh, that was that's just sick. for filming. And we did like a hypey's living room video and decorated it to make it look like a shoe wall but the thing is That's everybody awesome. thought that that was his actual like the place that he was living with his uh with his wife and right. um they're like well like what that's not a house it's like a it's like a hype beast room like a 13 year old's <laughs> bedroom but we did that on purpose um but little did people know and we put this like at the end of the video you go to his like actual uh the place where the other suite that he was living in um and it didn't it had like it had like a bait bear brick but other than that it was like just a very nicely designed like rove concepts uh Atlanta apartment and yeah. it had no mm -hmm. sense of hype piece in it. I thought that was like kind of interesting because you would think that there'd be like Supreme on the walls and, and all that. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah, home design is definitely very cool and how it's all tied together. Um, Ikea and, and Virgil and that whole definitely. world connecting together. So I think the next thing I wanted to ask you about and how I found your channel was, um, the story, I think you have a very unique story of how you met Virgil and, uh, had him sign your shoe and got to show him some designs. Yeah, yeah, that was a that was a crazy experience. That was right when my um, that was maybe when I had like thirty or forty thousand subscribers. It yeah, was yeah. very it was pretty early on. Yeah. Um. So basically, what happened was there was in two thousand and seventeen there was um 
uh, right before Virgil was releasing all the off-white stuff, they were having like random, they called them office hour events around the country. And uh, the way that you would enter is like you'd go on the sneakers app. Do you guys have the sneakers app? No, we hear about it all the you time. Know? Most of the guys I follow are American, so I always see like, right. the, oh, I took another L. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also yeah. never won a raffle. I've had to pay resale for <laughs> yeah, every single right. pair of shoes, yeah. aside from uh, like occasionally like Stadium Goods or StockX will will do something. But yeah, the we always Evo. Everyone's got that one friend that wins every single pair of shoes, and they've no, already got like crazy. ten of them at retail. It's <laughs> nuts. <laughs> It's it's frustrating, and, and it's, it was the same way with the uh, with the office hours things. You had to enter like basically through a raffle. Um, I didn't win any of those. What happened was I, I went on the website one day at work, and I was scrolling through it like for for the office hour events, and there was one event that wasn't full, and I was wondering why that was. So I clicked on the info, and it turned out in order to enter this event, you had to write an essay on why you deserve the chance to talk to Virgil about design. And I was like, well, sick. I'm a I'm literally <laughs> a professional designer. I could do this. So I wrote this essay. I sent it in, not expecting anything. And then the next day, uh, I got this letter back that said that me and 10 other people won the chance to actually go meet with him. So we went in, and the crazy thing about this event was that this was one of the only events where not only you could meet him, but you could also buy the shoes. Like all the other events were just like time slots to people for people to come in and like check out the shoes on the wall and the stuff. The Chicago's? Um, Chicago, everything. Oh, yeah, so Chicago. Lucky. It was like, it was wow. like the, <laughs> it was nuts. But oh man, so okay, so I go in. Um, it was, uh, I got its time slot on like the first of the two days that they let the 10 people in. Um, and I was the last person for that day. And so what they had you do when you first walk in is they give you this list of all the sneakers that they had and you rank them in order of which one that you want to buy. And then you write like your size and things like that. And then they give you a random one based on like what their stock is. Yeah. So I obviously put the Chicago's at number one and I think the Presto's at number two and Blazer's and all sort of good stuff. Um, and so they didn't tell me what shoe I got until literally I went to go pick it up. But um, I just sat there all day waiting for something to happen um, and Virgil just left. And I was like, what the hell? That's crazy. So uh, <laughs> I talked to one of the people who were running the events cause she, and she was like, yeah, he had to run and go do something like, I'm sorry. And she's like, if you want to come back tomorrow, you can. And I was like, okay, well, can I at least still buy the pair of shoes that I was supposed to be able to buy? And she's like, fine, whatever. So I go to the, um, to the counter to buy them. And I, the guy in front of me is trying to get the Chicago's and he's also a size nine and he's like, oh, are there any of the Chicago's left? And they're like, no, not any size nines. So I quickly go on my sheet and change it to a size eight and a half because <laughs> um, uh -huh. I assume there are probably more eight and a halves and I can sort of fit an eight and a half. So then when, when I handed the guy my sheet, he took it and he somehow came back with the size eight and a half of the Chicago. So I got a pair, which was amazing. Um, then I go home that night, film the review. Um, and then I'm like, okay, well, I've got another chance to meet with Virgil tomorrow. I should bring the shoe back and see if he'd sign it because the way that the, the, the event was set up is you talk to Virgil first and then you buy the shoes. So you never yeah. have a chance to actually have him sign them. Um, so I brought back one one side of the pair the next day and I, got, I finally got my chance to meet with him. And then after the interview, I pulled it out and I was like, yo, can you sign this for me? And he did, which is dope. He wrote Air Fowler, which is incredible. He didn't write Virgil was here, um, which is kind of frustrating because pe some people didn't believe that it was Did you write it on the shoe? Watch the vlog. I mean, you have a photo. Yeah, yeah. I, could, yeah. I could write it on the shoe, yeah. <laughs> I do have a photo, which helps. Um, but yeah, no, it was an incredible experience. And he's just, I mean, I had, honestly, I had followed him a little bit, but I wasn't like a huge Virgil fan at the time. Mm. Um, and just hearing sort of his experience and giving and him giving advice on just how to explore and, and continue to grow in the design space was really cool. Um, what was some of that advice the, that he gave you? I, I honestly don't remember it, <laughs> but I do have, they gave me this little, they let you record it on this little um, like recorder because he yeah, wasn't, yeah. he wasn't allowing people to be filmed. Like I tried yeah. to bring my camera, they wouldn't we'll let put me We'll put the interview it. on the, uh, like the, the link to the video and the mm -hmm. audio clip as well. Here's you guys. My main inspiration is, I guess the beach first right. and foremost, and like the, the ocean and then just that mix of basketball. That's awesome. It's my <laughs> two big inspirations. That's yeah. awesome, man. What I say a lot is conversation. Right. Like every single idea that I have comes from conversation, wordplay, witty friend, good circle of people around me that inspire ideas. Like right. I'm genuinely, don't, I don't sit around by myself, you know, right. like, and so through conversation, I start adding different things together and it's like endless pit. That's awesome. Cool. Is your goal, like career goal is to mm -hmm. do what? I don't know. I'm just enjoying it right now. Yeah, yeah. That's, I'm, I'm, that's a bad answer, but yeah, nah, that's bad. that's the right answer in a way. <laughs> like you, your career find you in this modern world. Like, right. By talking, my thing again is like if you talk about what you want to do, you're gonna meet one person that's like, oh yeah, do this, or like, oh I need that, and you have like a unique skill set of making things 3D. Like yeah, industrial design, the skill set to know how to make things. It's a tool that like a bunch of kids could use to like. Totally. Do, I could do like soul unit like and you're into sneakers too. Oh, of course, yeah. 
a lot of what I was saying yesterday, the biggest like loophole in the game right now is if you're a sneaker designer, but you can actually make it. Yeah. Because what happens is we're seeing so many photoshops that like, oh, here's they're great photoshops Photoshop. though. But imagine if like you put the, made a mold, right? Took your favorite Jordan and, and had it slip on somehow. Yeah. To it. Like if that's a cool. I think right. what you what I would say is like no career yet, but like making opportunities for yourself is totally. showing your work, crashing your love for sneakers. Like if you were That's in awesome. this mix, came to this right. school, it means you're into sneakers. That world doesn't know has anyone from industrial design. Exactly. World. Like those Raf Simmons sneakers. Yeah, you know? crazy. Like, I, I was here yesterday and I didn't get a chance to talk to you, but I was able to grab the shoes. Oh, sick! Awesome. It was yeah. It was I. I think it was something like I was talking about. Um, how I worked in, I was currently designing dog toys at BarkBox at the time and how mm. I was like really interested in the whole manufacturing process of like uh, how expensive it was to create rubber molds and things like that. Yeah. And just hearing him talk about his sort of experience with fashion and stuff, it was it was pretty cool. It was pretty incredible. Yeah, I think um, with, with Virgil, uh, it was there was like different phases of his career. There was the Pyrex Off-White, which was mm -hmm. like the big one. And um, after Adidas was doing all these like crazy collabs, the first like big one was the was the Nike 10 pack because eventually mm -hmm. Adidas started mm -hmm. making very large runs of, of, of some shoes. Uh, I remember I bought the Zebras and I, I traded like half, like quite a few big pieces in the collection to get the Zebras when they first came out. Like they must have been right. worth maybe about 2000 at the time. And they ended up yeah. releasing like they originally only going to re release what I heard was about 7,000 pairs. So I was like, okay, I got to get one. And um, eventually they, they just did a widespread release. I went to Milan, Italy in 2018 and I walked by the Adidas store or the Foot Locker store and they're like asking people to try it on. And out there people dress like very cl like classy, tailored business stuff. Not a single right. pair was selling. It was just like, come try really? it on and see if you like it. So that was probably one That's of my nice. biggest sneaker L's. But eventually um, the, the Nike 10 pack, it was it was great like it was very simple but i think i saw the harvard interview with or the harvard speech by virgil and mm -hmm. the way he talks about things like he, he talks relatively slowly but he picks his words very precisely that you're able to like soak in every word and and you feel mm -hmm. like it's so valuable and you really have to like listen into it and um, i think yeah. he mentioned something about how whenever he does like a collaboration he only wants to change three percent of the original design and with mm -hmm. the 10 pack, it was like that. It was like the the deconstructed look. And at first it's sort of like, well, that's very expensive for a simple pair. But then I think over time, at least in my case, the Jordans, the significance of it really came out. Um, like the deconstructed look. Uh, obviously, the Chicago, I'm guessing the Chicago's are your favorite piece of the collection. Um, yeah. But what did you uh, show Virgil in that uh, interview? Well, I gave him a business card, which apparently no one else had done, which I thought was kind of crazy. I always, I always carried around <laughs> nice little business word. cards. I was like, yo, yeah, right. I was like, I was like, yo, if you ever want any like rubber manufactured, hit me up. Yeah, and he didn't. Probably. But like, I thought I'd try. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> I talked about, um, I showed him some of my sneakers that I had customized, um, and I talked about just, uh, I, I before that I had worked in kitchenware at this uh, place out in Long Island designing like stuff for Farberware and a little bit of KitchenAid, um, and I'd shown him some of that stuff. I made this coffee press that I was really proud of, um, but I just showing him my portfolio and talking through it with yeah. him was pretty cool and getting his insight, and it's interesting how much my sort of design career changed after that conversation i wouldn't say because of that conversation yeah. but i would say just because of the way that youtube turned out which is actually i guess in a roundabout way it was because of that conversation because the same way that you found that video um that was the first time you'd seen me a lot of people found me that way yeah. um that was actually i think one of the most pivotal pivotal moments in my youtube career which i never realized would be the case but it was and it, it's uh that was definitely a pretty incredible experience. Yeah, like as a, as a sneaker video consumer um, at the time, I think what what I liked about it was that it was unique. Like we had seen a lot of the, I'm sure you know, uh, like the, these videos of like $20,000 unboxing, $15,000 mm -hmm. unboxing, rare shoe. And it was interesting. And when the shoe comes out, you're going to watch those. But over time, I think like after six months of being like into sneakers, uh, you, you don't really watch many of those anymore. Uh, so having something yeah. different, like the design side, I've always liked to see like how things were how things were designed and how they were made was what made the the channel very unique. Um, even though I didn't have any experience in like using software and my drawings don't look that good anymore. I'm trying to use that iPad uh, pencil a little bit more, but um, <laughs> yeah, I saw how you like do the, uh, the Wacom thing. And um, I think, yeah, I think I'd love, I'd love to have you talk about the, the process of, of those videos where you kind of yeah. sit down and, um, and, and draw a shoe and it's definitely not easy having a camera recording while you're trying to design something like 
Yeah, it's uh, it's it's definitely the longest videos that I film because most I've gotten my my videos. They're so formulaic. I can knock them out pretty quickly. Yeah. Like a review, I could probably knock out in like three hours from filming to editing, just because it's so it's so quick and it's pretty much all the the content of the video changes, but these the format doesn't yeah, change. Yeah. So it's really easy to knock out. But the the if I design videos take probably an entire day to two days just wow. because it's like seven hours of filming and then you know editing seven hours of footage is, is the worst but what i try oh, to do gosh. for those videos is like a couple days before i'll try and sketch up some contents or concepts beforehand just yeah. so i have some idea of what i'm going to do going into it because i've done live streams where i had no idea what i was going to what i was going to do and then i'll start sketching stuff and it, it'll be like a direction that i like but i won't be able to fully flesh it out and then um like later on, I'll, I'll continue fleshing it out on my own, and I'll be like, "Wow, I should have done this beforehand, so it would have looked better." But um, so usually, I'm a little bit prepared for those videos. Um, but the whole idea behind that was um, I really wanted to show off my design side because yeah. I felt like that was such a unique perspective uh, coming at the, like sneakers. Um, because so when when this all started, people were just reviewing sneakers, and everyone was talking about the same stuff, and I wanted to go <laughs> in from. I, yeah, I mean, I, I was sick of talking about like, oh, this sneaker's red, which to be fair, I talk about, I mean, that's what I say in a lot of the reviews, like, oh, this is the color, this is whatever. But I just really wanted to come at it with a perspective of like, I've manufactured things in the past, I sort of know how things go together. I might not be the most familiar with fashion, but I know generally how things are created. And yeah. because of that, I'm able to give it a more unique perspective. And then once I, once I had sort of done that, I really thought that it'd be kind of more interesting to actually try it for myself. And um, sneaker design was not something I ever thought that I would do because as much as I like sneakers, I was, I always thought that, I don't know, I, I was never really into fashion design. So um, when I actually started doing that, that series, I started to realize, damn, this is pretty fun. So uh, I just kept going and um, it's something that I don't do too often, like those videos, just because they take so long, but it's something that, you know, um, I'm, I might start pushing more and maybe like once a week if I have the time. Mm. Yeah, I'd love to know more yeah. about your process for the We Are Underdogs and Seth Fowler, man. Those were a, that yeah. was a clean design. And for someone who's followed sneakers Thanks, a long man. time, I really liked how, how it was a neutral. I liked how you brought out the back toe a little bit. I'd love to know more about from doing those If I Design videos. Like, what did you learn from that that transcended into that design? So this is it. This is the We Are Underdog Seth Fowler origin. This is um, this is like the third sample, I think, the final sample. It's kind of beat up because I've worn it a bunch, um, but I'm I'm really happy with how it turned out. And sort of the the process behind this shoe, I guess, started um, probably the middle to the beginning of last year, and it wasn't even with this shoe. The first shoe I designed actually is this uh, this Planters Peanut shoe. <laughs> <laughs> which um, I did with uh, with I think it was Vayner Media, um, Planters Peanuts, and then this um, this sneaker factory in in Philadelphia. And the whole idea behind it, or what happened with this, was that they had reached out probably the end of 2018 and were like, "Hey, we've got a shoe coming out. We'd love you to review it." And I was like, "Great, no problem." Was and that then, Gary um, V's shoe? Uh, hmm? Was that Gary V's shoe? That was, it was similar, he was, I don't know if he was directly involved with it, but I know that someone at VaynerMedia had sketched a shoe and, and sent it to um, Planters Peanuts and was like, hey, do you guys want to make this shoe? And Planters was like, sure. So, <laughs> nice. so um, they had they had Garrison in Philadelphia make it, but they, they I don't know if the, um, there was something like, something in the process didn't really work out. I don't know if the design wasn't manufacturable or something, but they sent me a sample of the shoe, or they sent me a picture of the sample and were like, hey, would you be down to review this? Um, and it just didn't it didn't look very good and it wasn't that the the design was bad or that the factory was bad it's that something had, i don't know something had gotten mixed up and it just didn't look very good and i was like I, I don't want to review that because I don't think it's going to do very well for the channel, which might sound douchey, but it's it's genuinely a problem. <laughs> I got and you. Then, um, integrity. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because at the end of the day, it'd be it'd be a sponsored video, and I'd have to say like, oh, I really like this when I I didn't, and I wouldn't oh, I wouldn't <laughs> say oh I really like this, but I'd I'd like judge it up a bit. You know? <laughs> so mm. um so. What I, what I talked to my manager about was, could I actually pitch them the, the idea of designing the sneaker? Because I've been doing If I Design videos for a while. And he's like, sure, what do you have to lose? So I pitched them the idea. Um, they agreed for some reason. I don't know why. And then uh, over the next like couple weeks, I designed um, this shoe for them. And then Garrison ended up making it. Um, and so this was the first shoe that I ever had that went on sale. Um, it's a promo shoe. And it's, it's obviously in Planters colors, which are not my favorite colors in the world, blue, yellow, and black. But um, I'm really stoked with the way it came out. The materials are nuts. Uh, I didn't even mean that plan. Uh, <laughs> hey. um, <laughs> but uh, the whole idea behind the sneaker was that I'd always loved the Jordan 1. That's always been my favorite sneaker. And I wanted to create a sort of old school basketball sneaker because 
Um, over the last couple years, basketball sneakers have become much more uh, like made of knits and made of like foam posits and things like that. They're not made of classic leathers and suede. So I wanted to create something that that was inspired by those old like 80s basketball sneakers. Um, and, and the whole idea behind this design was that it was supposed to be somewhat reminiscent of a peanut shape. I tried originally just drawing a straight up peanut and it looked terrible. So I sort of um, like really, I guess, pulled and accentuated the, the lines of the shoe and um, it ended up kind of looking like the uh, the Reebok Kamikaze a little bit. But um, I really liked the way it came out and this was sort of, this was sort of like my first um, sort of foray into the sneaker design world. And the way that led to the, uh, to the We Are Underdog sneaker, um, well, let me explain first who We Are Underdogs is. They are a uh, sneaker manufacturer out of Portugal, um, and they all the work that they do, um, they do in Portugal, like within, I think, five minutes of the actual company, and then all the materials that they use are sourced from, locally in Portugal or um, th uh, from Italy. So, like, all these all these leathers and suede were either taken from, like, a, I don't know where they, like a tannery somewhere mm. in Portugal or taken from Italy. And then this mid or this cup sole was actually uh, molded five minutes from the other factory also in <laughs> Portugal. So it's it's a really cool like handmade sneaker. Um, but the whole reason that I went for this sort of design because basically the pitch behind this sneaker was create us a sneaker. We don't care what, what you do. We just uh, want you to create something that sort of has a uh, somewhat luxury feel to it. Yeah. Um, because we, they just he just reached out. He's like, I like your channel. I like what you do. I'd love to collaborate with you on something. Um, so the reason I went with this sort of design is because I've always, I, the first, if I ever designed, a, in my head, I, if I ever designed a sneaker, I wanted to create like a shoe that was really classic looking first and then I would create something that was really crazy because I wanted to prove to myself that I can create something that's simple and still looks okay. Sure. So that was the, that, this was the high top version um, of like the simple classic shoe and then this is the low top. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to use again those those classic materials like the suede's and the new bucks and the leathers, um, and it just happened to work out that that we are underdogs is such a great company that you only uses those materials. Um, so the idea behind this was um, just a, a simple, low top sort of luxury inspired sneaker that um, that's easy to rock. And uh, the way that the process behind designing the shoe was also kind of cool because I did it all on on YouTube and on Twitch. So I did a lot of the sketching on Twitch and then I put videos over on YouTube. I did if I design videos about like creating the sneaker. And then um, I had people vote on different designs. Yeah. So I think it was like I had maybe 10 initial designs and then I narrowed it down to two. And then I had like this, this big vote between this design and then like a sort of retro inspired runner design. Um, this one won, and then this colorway won, and uh, we ended up manufacturing it, which was kind of crazy. So um, it's it's been a long process. It started this particular shoe design started in November of last year, and then uh, it's finally shipping. I think this weekend. Wow, yeah, man. They, I, I really like the way that you've combined the the bright orange with the light blue and the brown. Thanks, man. man. Yeah, yeah, it's good. What Appreciate do you think that. you've learned from this that you'll put into the next shoe design? I think the next one, I want it to be really crazy. Yeah. I found that, um, I, so as a sneaker reviewer, and I'm sure you've experienced this with tech reviews too, is that like people are really critical of everything, no matter what it is. Um, and, a haircut? And there's, <laughs> yeah, people are always like, no matter what you do in life, people are going to give you crap for it. So um, I, I, I always kind of expected it with videos, but when I actually designed something and, and made it public, something that people could buy, I did not realize how intense some people's like criticism would be yeah. and for videos it's fine because i put out a new one like every day it's like whatever i put out a bad bad video one day you know it's not a big deal um but for something that you've worked on for so long yeah. it hits you a lot harder so just with to jump in, in mind, for context like what was some of the criticism you received so some of the criticism that i received was there was a couple things some of some of the things like um price point this is a 200 hundred dollar shoe and then also um like some people didn't like the, the height of the midsole. Price point I couldn't change because that was the, the price point that the company set and also the materials that we used required that price point because yeah, it is sure. like really high quality it's materials. Crafted. And then for the midsole, um, this they gave me four different options for midsoles so I could only pick from four different things so I yeah. kind of had to work with what I was given. Um, I don't mind it, but some people didn't like it because they felt like it was a little bit too thick. Um, on a personal note, it's not too thick. It's just because there's no color. Like if you notice on the Chicago's, the midsole is yeah, actually yeah. the same exact height, but because there's a color split right there, it looks thinner. So <laughs> and I think people don't so realize the cost of like of doing prototypes and samples and everything. Um, because I co-own exactly. a clothing company, and like clothing is already relatively expensive to prototype. I'm guessing a shoe mm -hmm. costs significantly more than clothing because there's so many different materials, different cuts. You got to make sizes. Like the size yeah. run is quite wide. 
Whereas in clothing, yeah. it's like a small, medium, large, extra large sort of thing. Um, so yeah, people always want to complain about the price. And I think with tech products too, they all say, well, why is this stuff so expensive uh, sort of thing? Well, like as tech reviewers and stuff, we have to review like usually the higher end product because a brand that sends a product wants you to, to, to make it the best of the best. And, um, and I feel like for any shoe, like a, a $200 shoe is not necessarily expensive considering it is, it is custom made and right. custom designed the, the months of work that went into it and the quality materials, um, from Italy and Portugal, whereas like a Nike and Adidas, you don't really know where, where the materials come from all the time. Yep. Yeah. And, and, the and, and these are, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And, and the volume that they're being produced at, like in the large, totally. Runs. Totally. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's something that people don't understand. And I don't think people will ever understand. And so that's the kind of uh, criticism that, you know, I can sort of let brush off my back. Um, it's, it's the stuff that really gets you. And I think this is true for videos too, is the people who like are big fans, but they're like, at the end of the day, they'll be, they'll say something really nice. Like, Oh, I love your videos, but your shoe sucks. It's stuff like that. It's just like, it's, it just, it's, it's whatever. So the, the, the point that I was getting at was that one thing that I've learned from designing anything in general is that, um, or at least designing this shoe is that you're going to have people who hate it regardless, no matter how good it is. Like people hate Yeezys, people hate Jordans and yeah. they're some of the best designed sneakers in the world. Um, so for the next one, I'm just not going to let people's opinions affect me at all. And I'm just going to create something ridiculous and it's going to be something that I like and I don't care if anybody else likes it. And that's just that. Um, with this shoe, there was definitely some crowd pleasing elements. And I feel like the fact that I let people vote on designs also mm -hmm. kind of swayed my decision a little bit too. Like yeah. I would, I would change up things based on people's opinions, which is fine. Um, and, but at the end of the day, it doesn't create something as original as it could have been. Like, um, for example, like we were talking about earlier, when you were saying that tech products, people don't realize that there's these huge groups of people, like all working on one thing and everyone's opinion kind of changes the design in some way. Yeah. I feel like you can create something really, really great that way, but it won't ever be as crazy or as out there or as game changing as, as it would be if it was like a few people or one or two people really just pushing as far as they could push, whether that's design, functionality, whatever. Um, so I think for the next for the next project that I do, I'm just gonna try and push it as far as I can and see what happens. Yeah, the whole like uh, survey thing is off, is tough. Like uh, mm -hmm. a lot of times you, you already know in the back of your head what you wanna go with, but then when you mm -hmm. put out a survey and everybody votes on the other one, you kind of have that debate between, um, okay, well, do I go with the common consensus or do I believe in what I what I wanted to put in? enough yeah. that over time it will grow on people. Um, a lot of mainstream sneakers that are attached to big names, like for example, Virgil and and like the collaborations that people are seeing, uh, at least back in, especially with Adidas and the Ultra Boost too, there was a lot of pairs where I thought it was extremely ugly when I first saw it. Mm -hmm. And I thought of that for like multiple months, but then for some reason, it, it, when it came out and there's videos of it and you see it around more often you're like well i think that actually looks pretty good and i can understand why they did it but if they had gone with what the general audience had wanted in it it wouldn't have looked anything like that so i exactly. think it's good that you um that like it's as a designer having a combination of products that you have everyone feel a bit involved in as well as ones that are completely um your opinions towards design is is great and i think like the next question that i was hoping to tangent into is in, in like the whole like formal education thing, um, mm -hmm. whether it's like art, filmmaking, photography, and in my case, business, my opinion towards business is that you don't really need to go through the formal education system and in filmmaking as well. I think a lot of it is picked up through trial and error and just being in the industry, starting out by working for free and getting the experience where you need to. In the, in the field of industrial design, I, I feel uh, like my outside opinion is that um, formal education is very valuable, similar to architecture. Uh, what is what is your perspective on that? So I agree. You don't you don't have to go to school to do it at all. Um, the one thing that I learned, uh, the one thing that I found most valuable about my my education was that um, I went to Drexel in Philadelphia. That's actually how I ended up. I, I met my it doesn't my friend goes there, actually <laughs> not for it's a great school. Well. I love it. <laughs> but the but the reason I love that school so much is because they require you to have um, I forget what they call it but it's it's basically internships like six month internships yeah. and it counts towards your your educate or your um your actual like it gives you college credit or whatever uh, but it's required unlike some colleges which suggest it during the summer but they don't require it yeah um and and those internship experiences were some of the the most um, I think important experiences in my life, not only because I got jobs through meeting people on those internships, but it was really being able to apply what I've learned in college 
um, to the real world and realizing that yes, you know, there is stuff that you learn in college that is important in the real world, but there's so many other things like um, collaborating with, with people um, and, and just really um, creating things that, one thing I found that I think a lot of designers don't realize is that they create things that, that they think look good and that they think everyone will like, but and sort of like we were just talking about, but people don't realize that there are so many other factors that go into it. Like yeah. one thing that I always thought was, I always was obsessed with Apple's design. So when I went into college, all my sketches, like for the first <laughs> year, looked like Apple products. Like, That's they why looked, I like, wanted simple, to go to like, industrial design. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And then you don't realize until you start working or start really looking into, you know, what goes into an Apple product. Those materials are insanely expensive. Apple has this insane manufacturing process that they're somehow how it, they are somehow able to do that most other companies can't. Um, it's it's cost of materials, yeah. it's cost of labor, it's working with factories. Some factories can't create things; they just literally can't because they don't have the uh, capabilities. And it's also. Um, you know, Apple takes a lot of risks. They do things that most people wouldn't. Um, and they, they set like, for example, those, those iMac wheels, like that's, that's crazy. $700 wheels. They look dope, but that's crazy. Um, like they take these insane risks that other companies would never take. And it's because they take those risks that they're, that they're doing so well. And I think, um, you know, people think that that's the, people think that Apple is kind of the gold standard and that yeah. everyone, that, that, the, that for some reason, no, not everyone is trying to be like Apple, but there's reasons that people aren't trying to be like Apple because they're one of the only few that can make that sort of, um, business model work. I feel like, because they're the only ones who really have built up this luxury brand and it took them years to do. But like, you know, if you work for Logitech, which is a great brand, they create, you know, consumer products that most people can buy. Yeah. So when you work for Logitech, you have to create something that's made of plastic. It has to cost a certain amount. You have to remove features because, you know, they're too expensive. You have to use like a cheaper, I don't know, like webcam lens or whatever it is you put in there just because it's, it's cheaper and they can't afford to put in like, you know, a crazy thing. Like so the I think one on ours? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we actually yeah. I actually visited uh, Logitech's headquarter last year in, um, mm -hmm. in That's Geneva. Awesome. Uh, where was it? It might have been Geneva. Yeah, it was Geneva Lake in midsummer, and it was for the MX Master Three mouse. And uh, even oh, though it awesome. was like an iterative uh, model from the two, and the two is already a great mouse. It's every tech YouTuber seems to have the MX Master line for video editing because the horizontal scrolling. It was crazy to see the table laid out with all of the plastic, the clay, and the prototypes that went into a incremental upgrade. And they also had like a basement where they spent like, like the Swiss are really good at designs, like the, whether yeah. it's the timepieces and everything. Um, and even visiting Dyson, the commonalities we notice is that there's always somebody in each department that is so specifically focused on one area. With Logitech, it Definitely. was the scrolling mouse. Uh, there was one guy who had been in the basement which doesn't have any windows and it's like 30 degrees Celsius uh, Fahrenheit, that would be like 90 or hundred or something like that. But um, he would just, he was there for a year and a half to work on the new scroll wheel, uh, the metal scrolling mechanism. And there was also another room where they had hundreds, if not thousands of keyboards and mouses clicking at the exact same time to test how many times you can press it before it breaks. And you're just standing in that room. There's no air conditioning out there. And there's this lady who's, who's like full-time job is, is just in that room and you just hear millions or thousands of clicks per second testing that. And I think seeing the behind the scenes process of that and the drawings that they went through, even for just like what you would call a minor uh, improvement was, uh, was very cool. And I think what Apple has done very well is in design, you hear the phrase being thrown around, which is simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. A lot of times people feel like they have to, to do more in the design, like, oh, it's too simple, it's too boring, it's too similar. And what Apple has done well is is like essentially make it so that you look at the design, you appreciate it for what it is, but it isn't anything complicated. And eventually mm -hmm. it does grow on people. Like remember when AirPods came out, everybody was yeah. getting hate for AirPods and now every knockoff yeah. company is trying to make them look exactly yep. like yeah. AirPods. It's like a household thing now. You're used to seeing it. And once you're used to seeing it, you're like, wow, like what Apple had been able to do in making a four gram earbud that is fully wireless and that no competitor has been able to catch up to in the th two or three years that it's been out is mm -hmm. is crazy. And um, bold decisions are what they're known for, like the Mac Pro, the XDR, the stand, which looks it's great in my opinion. I know a lot of people were hating on it. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a good transition into like the, the last question, which is about technology and um, what your relation is with technology. And in the whole design thing, I think it's cool how, yeah, you integrated the, um, the side of industrial design into sneakers. And um, I'm a big believer in like a YouTube channel. You want to 
have your passions aligned with what your flagship is. So in your case, that Definitely. sneaker is design ties in with that. In my case, I did like home decor and renovation and like design stuff uh, in conjunction with home technology and consumer tech. Uh, and I think that's how you really show the passion on the on the channel, because a lot of times our main industries can get quite boring. Like there's a ton of shoes mm -hmm. coming out like constantly and it's like the same structure which is like the bread and butter of the channel. But like in tech, for example, how many phones are coming out a year? And they're all like, for the most right. part, using the same camera sensors, same chips and everything. Uh, so yep. what is like kind of your relation with tech and uh, what what do you like about it uh, compared to sneakers and almost like a break from sneakers sometimes? Well, my first my first YouTube channel ever was a tech channel. <laughs> I That's tried funny, it for a actually. while, it didn't work <laughs> no out for me. Way. My first, so basically what happened was in 2007, I think it was 2007, I bought the Xbox 360 Elite. Yeah. And so I put out a review on YouTube and I think it was like one of the first reviews out on YouTube of the Xbox 360 Elite. And the video got like 300,000 views and I was like, this is it. I'm making it big in tech, baby. This is happening. <laughs> that was a lot then, back in the day though. 2007, like yeah. I did an Xbox oh, yeah. like hard drive replacement video so you didn't have to pay for the, the Xbox one and 100,000 views uh -huh. back then was my most viewed video. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it was, it blew my mind. I was like stoked. Yeah. Um, and then I didn't realize, so I tried to, I was trying this channel that like had tech and then comedy skits and like all this other, it was just, I was what, when, in 2007 I was, I was in high school, I was probably, I don't know, 15, 16, something like that. I didn't realize that you had to be very uh, careful about what you post on your channel and keep it consistent, like that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I, I would look up, I would look up to people like uh, uh, I, Justine and uh Techno Buffalo, yeah, um, and uh, and I, I always wanted to be like them, but I never, in the same way that you said, like you had to start reviewing um, just everything and anything that you could find. <laughs> I just never realized that it never clicked with me. I was like, oh, I put out this one great video. Maybe you know, if I get something else in the future, maybe I'll put out another video. And in the meantime, I'll put out just like crappy skits that no one wants to watch. Um, and so that kind of just died out. But I always still had a passion for tech. Like the for me, one of the most interesting things that happened in like the mid two thousands was the the console war between PlayStation Three, Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty, and the Wii, and just seeing that whole thing play out and just uh, experiencing like motion um, controls for the yeah. first time was so so dope. I still have a um, Wii. I was always into. Oh, I love the Wii, man. Like I don't. <laughs> I, I love the Wii. I wish the Switch would have more like motion games, dude. It's it's. Yeah. it's a, I probably shouldn't do this anymore, but <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> hey, man, I still play Super Smash, bro, with the nunchuck and the Wii remote. That's the way. Yeah, yeah, That's the way. It. It's funny enough. Um, yep. actually, Harrison Neville started out in tech too, and from and when he showed really? me his old videos with like the long Bieber cut. I feel like I recognize him back in the day because Harrison and I are two years apart. I, I'm 23. I think he's 24, 25. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, I feel like back in the day, we definitely came across each other's videos. And um, and another friend, uh, Rob Strzok, who does like travel videos and photography. That's awesome. He actually used to make videos on my channel as well. And um, everyone kind of split off and did like, uh, like whether it was travel or, or fashion. So it's funny how a lot of us actually started out in the tech industry reviewing um, products. And, and as you mentioned, uh, John Rettinger was someone I watched a lot. Uh, I Justine, mm -hmm. Soldier Knows Best, Detroit Borg, yep. Um, yep. and also Locker Gnome was one of the biggest tech channels at a time. Uh, and Wilson Tech One is also really funny. But um, that, yeah, that was, that was that must have been like 2010 or so. Do you remember Freddie W as well? With the oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Kept yep. Jumba. That was, yeah, Kep man, Jumba. Th like 2010 was like the golden age of YouTube. There like, was no was algorithm amazing. thing. Like the algorithm was mm -hmm. not as complicated. It was just, and then you had like the star ratings. You had to get a thousand yep. subscribers before mm -hmm. you get a custom banner. Back then yep. it was just like, there was no like politics behind it. It was straight up just like you I come know. home from school, you make some videos and you have fun with it. And then you go back go on to do your regular teenager stuff, like play some road hockey. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, uh, a lot of guys in techno are actually really into sneakers. Uh, I think I started mm -hmm. doing videos of sneakers in 2016, 17, but, um, That's like awesome. TLD is a huge sneaker guy. Um, when mm -hmm. I filmed the video with, uh, Rettinger, he was rocking Jordans as well. Nice. And, um, Danny Winget also loves his sneakers. So it's actually cool to see like the whole crossover. And when I saw you started making tech videos, I was like, that's really cool as well, because it's like a new perspective. Um, someone who isn't traditionally like full time on tech side giving mm -hmm. a new take. And I think a lot of times entering industries that, um, that, are, that are just like things that you enjoy gives a new perspective. Cause a lot of us like, yeah, like even if we try to make each video interesting, it's bound to get a bit boring. And so yep. my tech videos on the channel, my dedicated videos on tech actually perform worse than like the home videos. Cause I'm guessing like naturally people can tell I'm excited to do a home video because I don't do them every day. 
Um, yeah. What's like your favorite recent piece of tech that has come out or what's like your, what do you, what do you live by in terms of like an everyday carry or mm-hmm. what phone do you use? Or I'm guessing you use I, iPhone. Uh, yeah. So you got a message, but you know, what's like your favorite pieces of tech and uh, what are you most excited for in the future? Well, my favorite, so I use uh, iPhone 11 um, Pro Max, I think is what, it, yeah, and I, I usually upgrade this every year because yeah. back when we were able to go outside, um, <laughs> back at the beginning of the year, um, <laughs> I, I would do like sneaker shopping vlogs and usually sneaker, sh- uh, sneaker stores don't like you having a big camera. And yeah. I found that the iPhone is just such like a capable 4K camera. Oh, yeah. This is the way to go. So I keep, I always keep it as a backup. Uh, AirPods, definitely. Um, back when I was traveling a lot last year, I found I would use my Switch constantly. I'd bring it with me whenever I'd travel. Um, but tech that I'm excited about this year, again, I think it's going to be like consoles again, like PlayStation five, oh, yeah. Xbox series X. Like that's what I'm just, I, I can't wait to see what they, what they come out with. I'm just so stoked to, um, cause I feel like it's gotten to a point now where in the same way that phones have kind of plateaued, I feel like consoles have kind of hit that point too. Um, yeah. maybe I, I, I'm probably kind of out of touch with that, but, um, I, I just feel like I'm excited to see what their killer apps are going to be like. What, what's that game that's going to make me want to buy it? Or what's that feature that that console is going to have? that's going to make me be like, damn, I need that. So I'm excited. Like, I think there's a PlayStation, uh, this press Thursday. conference or something coming. Yeah. Thursday. Yeah. I'm stoked on that, man. Did you watch the wait. other press conference? The one that was meant for developers, but consumers were watching it and got like bored out of their minds. They had like the cardboard cutout. Um, Dude, the people, oh my God, <laughs> the people that were sitting in the front row got, I, I watched it. Like, is this real? Is this real? I thought it was, I thought it was a joke, real. but no, it was yeah. real. <laughs> <laughs> Which side of the console were you on? Because um, I, I wouldn't say I'm biased towards it. I have pretty dumb reasons for picking a side. Uh, like I like the controller on PS4 more. A few more mm-hmm. friends are on PS4. So I have been on PS4 for the past uh, since it came out. But I have also had Xbox for a bit. And PS3 was like my first real console. Um, yeah. What's like your side of it? For me, um, it, it's weird. It switches. Like when I first got in, my first console ever was the Game Boy Advance. It wasn't even, it, my first handheld was the Game Boy Advance. Um, and I was I was really big into Nintendo. I had an N64. Then I got into PlayStation in, in like the PlayStation 2, Xbox yeah. phase. Then when it was Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, I was all Xbox 360. Then in this console age, I've been more, much more into the PlayStation 4. Yeah. I have all three, but I've been much more into the PlayStation 4. For this next one, I'm just going to stay open to it. Like sure. a lot of my friends, like you said, are on PlayStation. But there's just something like, there's something about Halo. And like a lot of those games on Xbox mm-hmm. that I just, I'm just obsessed with. So I'm... To be honest, I'm probably gonna buy both and uh, yeah. and just play. I, I I don't know which one I'll play more, but I think it just depends on the games. But I think at this point, like, I'm I'm open. I'm open, which is the first time that I've ever been able to say that. Like going into <laughs> PlayStation 4, Xbox, I was so Xbox 360. I was like, I'm getting an Xbox One no matter what. And then it looked like a VCR, and the games all kind of sucked. So I was like, screw that. I'll try PlayStation. PS4 was so hard to get. Yeah, Halo kind of died oh, no. at that point too. That's I did the, like what you just described is exactly the way I did my video games, man. I think most kids did that as well. It was just based on yep. momentum with games. Like yeah. Halo and Xbox 360, they were peanut butter and jam, man. <sighs> yeah, it was a good yep. combination. But like, then there was like Red Ring of Death, and then there um, was. Yeah, but I you're know. willing to sacrifice it for Halo. It was just such a good game. And like I remember the it original Xbox. Game. I must have been under. I must have been under 10 years old at the time. Um, it used to take 45 minutes to load a game. And for some, somehow at that age, we had the patience to like look out the window. Like the parents used to tell us to like look out the window until the game loads just, or get some fresh air. And back then, like we were, we were just like looking at the Xbox and you would never know when the game would actually load. But like my friend would be like, Oh, it took 45 minutes the other day. It took 10 minutes the next day. (laughs) So you would just like, all of a sudden you see that thing pop up and you run over to the screen and then it takes another 10 minutes to get to the next menu. Um, But I, I was like similar to you. I was like, I saw the Xbox and it came out a little bit before the PS4 and it was mm-hmm. readily available. Mm-hmm. So I went and bought the Xbox one and, um, and then the PS4 came out and I couldn't get my hands on it. The place I got it was actually on a family vacation in Hawaii. Somebody for no some way. reason returned it and they had an open That's box crazy. one at GameStop. So I carried Unreal. it all the way back to Canada <laughs> and uh, like just as a carry on. And uh, I sold the <laughs> Xbox and everything and hadn't looked back since. Um, but yeah, interesting enough, actually, the, the guy who designed the Xbox, um, Don Matrick, his daughter was in our grad class. So during the That's Xbox awesome. year, like the grad event, we we're just like looking back at the bleachers and we're taking the grad photo. And he just like, he's just like walking by Crazy. <laughs> for some reason he That's chose awesome. to live in Victoria, but 
Yeah. Um, thank you so much for, for sitting down with us. This yeah. is definitely like the best yeah, interview we've had so far. Um, oh, that's awesome. I yeah. appreciate that. You're really good at talking, uh, like even on <laughs> the fly, like you made like no mistakes. Usually we have to like cut out on our end and, and stuff like that. But this, is, this was really good. And um, hopefully we can, um, we can meet up at an event one day, maybe definitely. even tech. Like a, I know Google's been taking, um, uh, people outside of tech industry as well, um, and flying them to New York. And I'll definitely put in a good word if I have an American rep, but Sick. I really want to, yeah, really hope to meet up someday and, uh, definitely. let me know if you're ever in Canada. So I think that was definitely one of our best interviews to date. Mm -hmm. And I really hope you guys enjoyed that episode of the feature podcast. As always, check us out on your favorite platform, whether it is Apple Podcasts, leave a review, Spotify, Google, or on YouTube, where you get to enjoy the full experience of both the visuals and the designs that we showed and talked about in this one. And just subscribe to that. Leave a comment down below if there's anything that we can improve on. And we'll see you guys in the next one.